The unique and independent American woman, adventurer, pioneer, poet, mother, educator, artist, freedom fighter. A history of women's achievement in America is an incredible 400-year story of American women's inspiring accomplishments and victories. Destined to play an essential role in the shaping of the United States, American women forged an identity unlike any other in the world. That identity found a voice as they created great literature and science. American women led the fight to end slavery limit corporate power, provide education for all, and to protect the poor, the disenfranchised, the immigrants, and the insane. At the same time, these unique American women would have to fight tirelessly for their own equality in politics, education, and the workplace, even the right to vote. Hello, I'm Donna Mills, and welcome to the third episode of A History of Women's Achievement in America. The years surrounding the Civil War were a time of great empowerment for American women. It was a time when they spoke out loud and clear on the evils of slavery and other social ills. Black women guided Southern slaves to freedom in the North. A new kind of female hero emerged from the writings of Louisa May Alcott. And in upstate New York, women organized for the first time to gain the right to vote. By the middle of the 19th century, the dark side of slavery, particularly the taking of black children from their mothers, was exposed to Northerners through the heart-wrenching, shocking story of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. I have been the mother of seven children, the most beautiful and most loved of whom lies buried near my Cincinnati residence. It was at his dying bed and at his grave that I learned what a poor slave mother may feel when her child is torn away from her. In those depths of sorrow which seemed immeasurable, it was my only prayer to God that such anguish might not be suffered in vain. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote those words to Eliza Cabot Fullen, December 16, 1852. This was the same year that Harriet Beecher Stowe published the seminal account of slavery in the United States, Uncle Tom's Cabin. By the end of that year, the book had sold over 300,000 copies. Its impact on the nation can be summed up in the legendary meeting with President Lincoln in 1862, when he said, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that created this great war. The book chronicles the story of Eliza Harris, a slave mother whose child is about to be sold. She runs, escaping a slave catcher and later connecting up with the Underground Railroad to freedom. Another slave, Uncle Tom, is sent down the ice and dies a martyr's death at the hands of the evil Simon Legree. The book itself was significant because it established the American tradition of realistic writing. Harriet was also the first U.S. female to achieve international fame as an author. She put slavery in a human form and converted many people to the abolitionists' cause. By reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, many Northerners understood the suffering of slavery for the first time. I beseech you, pity those mothers that are constantly made childless by the American slave trade, and say, mothers of America, is this a thing to be defended? sympathized with, passed over in silence. Ironically, 50 years later, the term Uncle Tom would become a pejorative 
indicating a black man who cooperated with Southern whites instead of standing up for black rights. Emily Dickinson is one of the world's greatest poets. Her poetry ignored conventional rhyme, meter, and theme to express wholly original ideas in astoundingly new ways. She walked the corridors of her Massachusetts home, dressed all in white, and was known as the Nun of Amherst. A recluse, she became more famous in death than in life for her unique and inspiring poetry. She was Emily Dickinson, America's first truly great woman poet. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell. They'd banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog. To tell your name, the live long day, to an admiring fog. Emily Dickinson's style was experimental. Her poems stretched the limits of traditional verse. She used dashes instead of commas for punctuation. She produced unconventional and jarring rhyme schemes. And she expressed the independent spirit of American women in soulful, vibrant tones. Unique and passionate, Dickinson's poetry would echo down through the generations. Emily Dickinson was born in Amherst, Massachusetts on December 10, 1830, part of a family whose ancestors arrived with the first Puritan colonists 200 years earlier. Outgoing as a teenager, Dickinson attended Amherst Academy, where she became popular among her fellow students and famous among teachers for provocative essays. Dickinson attended Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, recently founded by Mary Lyon. Once more, her independence caused a stir when she was the only student to refuse Christian indoctrination. She returned to Amherst in 1850 and immediately began to write poetry. Oddly, Dickinson's life and poetry were a study in contrasts. She wrote more than 1,700 poems, yet published only seven of them in her lifetime. Famous in later life for her solitude, her poetry is vivid and worldly. By a flower, by a letter, by a nimble love, if I weld the rivet faster, final fast, above. Never mind my breathless anvil, never mind repose, never mind the saute faces tugging at the forge. She never experienced physical love and yet her verse fills the senses and expands the heart. Emily Dickinson died in 1886. Over the past hundred years, her work has inspired a century of American poets. Dickinson herself is part of that elite group of English-speaking poets that include Shakespeare, Coleridge, Poe, Whitman, Cummings, and Eliot. No one better defined women's ability for heroic action in the face of extreme danger than Harriet Tubman. Known as the Black Moses, again and again she risked her life leading slaves to freedom. This home in Auburn, New York, is a memorial to one of America's greatest social leaders of the 19th century. It is a memorial to the most famous conductor on the Underground Railway. It is a memorial to Harriet Tubman. The Underground Railroad arose in pre-Civil War America and was a secret passage organized by Northern abolitionists to help escaped slaves come from the South to Northern free states and Canada. A typical route of the Underground Railroad would be from Maryland north to Delaware. From Wilmington, Delaware, fugitives traveled to Philadelphia, where sympathetic Quaker families hid the ex-slaves, fed and clothed them, 
and sent them north to New York. Here's a map of the many routes of the Underground Railroad. Today, many of the safe houses where blacks were cared for are historic sites. In 1849, Harriet Tubman was a black slave living in Maryland. Afraid that she would be sold into the Deep South, she used the Underground Railway to escape to New York. A year later, she returned to Maryland and freed her sister and her two children. From then on, there was no stopping this courageous woman from becoming the most famous conductor of the Underground Railroad. In all, Tubman made 19 trips to slave states. She devised clever ruses to get into and out of the South. She carried a pistol, which she used to keep faint-hearted fugitives heading north, declaring, you'll be free or die. By 1856, there was a $40,000 reward on Tubman's head. Still, she persisted in being the female Moses leading her people to freedom. During the Civil War, Harriet Tubman worked for the Union as a nurse and even a spy. When the war was over and blacks were free, Tubman returned to her home in Auburn, where she continued her involvement in social issues, such as the women's rights movement. She died at her beloved home in Auburn on March 10, 1913, at the age of 93. Louisa May Alcott's character, Jo Marsh, in her remarkable novel, Little Women, redefined American womanhood as a creative and independent thinker. Jo, like Alcott herself, resisted conventional domestic roles for women to support her family through her writing. The second half of the 19th century was a time of great progress for American women. Women's colleges and professional schools were opening across the country. Women were entering the professions, becoming doctors and scientists. For the first time, American women were able to imagine a life beyond the traditional role of wife and mother. Louisa May Alcott was born into this heady time of women's achievement. As a short story writer, editor, and novelist, she added a new dimension to American women's identity. She was the first female writer to earn a living at writing fiction. Her example encouraged generations of young women to challenge convention and seek their own path to financial independence. Louisa May Alcott was born on November 29, 1832, the second of four daughters. She spent her childhood in Concord, Massachusetts, among some of America's greatest minds. Alcott borrowed books from Ralph Waldo Emerson's library, learned botany on walks with Henry David Thoreau, performed plays in Nathaniel Hawthorne's barn, and listened to lectures by feminist Margaret Fuller. Louisa's father, Bronson Alcott, provided his daughters with plenty of intellectual nourishment but he was poor. Troubled by her family's poverty, young Louisa Alcott vowed, I will do something by and by. Don't care what. Teach, sew, act, write, anything to help the family. And I'll be rich and famous and happy before I die. See if I won't. Louisa May Alcott. It was a series of sensational stories under the pen name A.M. Bernard that started her on the path to fame and fortune. She quickly gained a small but loyal following, and in 1854, at the age of 22, she published her first book, Flower Fables. Alcott's big break as an author came in 1868. Thomas Niles, her publisher in Boston, requested that she write a book for girls. Never lacking for inspiration, she penned Little Women in just three months. Little Women was a huge success. It was the first novel to present a realistic and psychologically detailed portrait of American womanhood. Little Women, set in New England during the Civil War, 
was based on the experiences of Louisa and her sisters while growing up. The character of Joe March was based on Louisa May Alcott herself. And like Louisa, Joe was a tomboy who loved to write and struggled with the expectations of 19th century women. Joe, your book! Oh, can Joe. you believe it? Oh. Published. Little Women was originally published as two books. The first part dealt with the coming of age of the March sisters. And the second, which was originally titled Good Wives, dealt with their lives as they left home for marriage or work. Jo March's particular burden was her temper. And she really bristled against the domestic roles for young women of the time. She was a tomboy and she loved acting and she loved writing. And Jo really yearned, like the other um, uh, characters in Alcott's novels, she yearned to have honest hard work that was fulfilling both financially and also intellectually. With the end to slavery, American women could now focus their political energies on obtaining their own civil rights, particularly the right to vote. At her so-called trial for attempting to vote in Rochester, New York in 1872, the judge found her guilty and fined her $100. He then asked her if she had anything to say. Susan B. Anthony replied heatedly, Yes, Your Honor, I have many things to say. For in this your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. My natural rights, my civil rights, my political rights, my judicial rights are all alike ignored. Robbed of the fundamental privilege of citizenship, I am degraded from the status of a citizen to that of a subject. And not only myself individually, but all of my sex are by your honor's verdict doomed to political subjugation under this so-called form of government. Susan B. Anthony and a friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, became leaders in the campaign to give the right to vote to women. In 1870, black males gained the right to vote through the 15th Amendment. However, the journey for a woman's right to vote would be a long one. In 1878, the Women's Suffrage Bill was introduced in Congress, but not passed. Ironically, a Montana woman, Jeanette Rankin, would be elected to that same Congress before women would be allowed to vote in national elections. Finally, August 26, 1920. The 19th Amendment, allowing women the right to vote, was passed into law. It had virtually the same language as the bill introduced 42 years before. The women's suffrage movement was a part of a wave of reform activities that sprung up prior to the Civil War. William Ellery Channing noted, it may be said without much exaggeration, that everything is done now by societies. You can scarcely name an object for which some institution has not been formed. These societies would become institutions that have carried through into the 21st century, performing a balancing act to the many injustices perpetrated by big business and government. America had grown up in isolation from the world community. One woman, a Civil War hero would change that through her compassion and heroism. In this, her bedroom at Glen Echo House, a true American saint on April 12, 1912, at the age of 90, died. During her life, she became one of America's most beloved women. This house, once the headquarters of the American Red Cross, became the first National Historic Site dedicated to a woman. This woman was Clara Barton. Fifty years earlier, during the height of the Civil War, with 3,000 wounded men crying for help at the Battle of Bull Run,
Clara Barton moved on to the battlefield and did what she could with her supplies to alleviate the suffering of the soldiers. Army Surgeon General Dr. James I. Dunn wrote of her, at a time when we were entirely out of dressings of every kind, she supplied us with everything. And while the shells were bursting in every direction, she stayed dealing out shirts and preparing soup. I thought that night if heaven ever sent an angel, she must be one. Moving from battle to battle with her aid, Clara became known as the angel of the battlefield. She spoke of her own efforts. When you are in the presence of hardship and physical suffering, you do not stop to think about the interest of your own work. There is not time for that. Ease pain, soothe sorrow, and lessen suffering. That is your only thought, day and night. After the war, Clara Barton explored a new humanitarian organization in Switzerland known as the Red Cross. Its goal was to provide aid for the battle wounded without regard to nationality. Clara brought word of this organization back to America and immediately began working for its recognition by the United States government. By May 21, 1881, she had already set up the first chapter of the American Association of the Red Cross. A year later, on March 16, 1882, E.G. Lapham wrote to Barton from the Senate chambers, I have the gratifying privilege of informing you of the ratification by the Senate of the Geneva Convention. Not only did the United States government officially recognize the Red Cross, Clara Barton's efforts started the nation on the road to becoming a member of the International Fraternity of Nations. From its early days in Glen Echo House, the spirit of Clara Barton went forth into the fledgling organization. Until today, the Red Cross is stronger than ever, a model for caring and hope throughout the world. Wherever there is a disaster, the Red Cross is there. America's last frontier was the wild, wild west. This colorful era saw women ride like men and shoot like men. Indeed, women like Annie Oakley, Belle Starr, and Calamity Jane created legends of mythic proportions. The women on America's western frontier lived lives vastly different from their eastern counterparts. Life in the West was a continuous challenge, a battle for survival against a harsh climate, surprise Indian raids, and unexpected calamities. The customs and rules that sheltered women in the tranquil and sophisticated societies of New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Washington, D.C did not work in the rough and tumble towns of Denver, Deadwood, Tucson, and Abilene. The result was that women in the wild, wild west often abandoned traditional gender roles and enjoyed a freedom their eastern sisters could not have imagined. While eastern feminists such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton fought for women's rights with conventions, newsletters, and protests, Stories poured in from the West, telling of women horse thieves, army scouts, and trick shot artists. The names of women like Annie Oakley, Calamity Jane, and Belle Starr became linked with adventure, celebrity, and notoriety in dime novels and in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Annie Oakley was the queen of the Wild West. Born Phoebe Ann Moses on August 13, 1860, in the backwoods of Dark County, Ohio, Annie honed her remarkable shooting ability, hunting game. Her skill became legendary, and at age 15, Annie was invited to Cincinnati, Ohio to compete against America's best marksman, Frank E. Butler. To everyone's surprise, Annie bested him, hitting a perfect 25 targets. Butler was smitten by his competitor, and a year later, the two were married. Traveling with her new husband, Annie took the stage name Annie Oakley. Her shooting exhibitions became legendary. 
In St. Paul, Minnesota, Annie met with Lakota Indian leader Sitting Bull. He nicknamed her Little Sure Shot, and the name stuck. In 1885, Annie joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, where she soon became the star. She traveled the world. In Germany, she shot the ash from a cigarette held in the mouth of the Crown Prince Wilhelm. Throughout her 50-year career as a champion shot and performer, she taught the sport of marksmanship to countless women and young girls. Annie died on November 3, 1926, and Frank Butler followed on November 21st. Another Western heroine, one with less delicate sensibilities, was Calamity Jane. Born Martha Jane Cannery in 1852 in Princeton, Missouri, she was raised on the Nevada frontier. Calamity Jane had no use for hooped skirts, parasols, or corsets, but dressed and traveled as a cowboy, wearing a straight-brimmed hat, shirt and pants with chaps, a revolver, cartridge belt, and rifle. Throughout her life, she worked as a rider for the famed Pony Express, a scout for the U.S. Army during the Plains Indians War, and a freight driver, jobs that most men would not even attempt. She received her nickname in 1872 when she saved an army captain during an Indian raid near Goose Creek, South Dakota. Riding headlong into the skirmish, she grabbed Captain Egan, who was badly wounded, and carried him on horseback to safety. Later, Egan laughingly gave her the name that graced countless dime novels. I name you Calamity Jane, the heroine of the plain. Calamity Jane was as tough as any man and often spent her time in the saloons of the mining town Deadwood, South Dakota, drinking and gambling with another dime novel hero, friend and fellow Pony Express writer, Wild Bill Hickok. Like Hickok before her, Jane died and was buried in Deadwood. If Annie Oakley was the queen of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, then Belle Starr was the queen of the outlaws. Myra Bell Shirley was born in Carthage, Missouri in 1848. The daughter of a respectable Southern family, she attended the Carthage Female Academy as a young girl. By the time Bell was 18, she had fallen in love with Cole Younger of the Younger Outlaw Gang. Even though she was married twice, she would love Cole for the rest of her life. Starr even became friends with Frank and Jesse James. In 1866, Bell married Jim Reed, and the two turned to crime, stealing horses and cattle. Bell supported Reed's life of crime until 1874, when he was shot dead in Paris, Texas. Widowed and with a family to support, Bell pursued the only work she had ever known, thievery. From 1875 to 1880, Bell was the undisputed leader of a band of horse and cattle thieves who lived in Oklahoma's Indian Territory. To people back east, Belle Starr, wearing a plumed Stetson hat and a six-gun over her petticoat, was a female Robin Hood and the queen of the outlaws. In 1883, Bell became the first woman ever tried for a major crime in the courtroom of the famous Hanging Judge Isaac Parker. Convicted, she spent a year in prison before returning to her ranch. Six years later, a shotgun blast killed Belle as she was returning to her ranch, two days shy of her 41st birthday. Annie Oakley, Calamity Jane, and Belle Starr were women whose legendary exploits matched the fantastic truth of their lives. They did not fit into society's notions of how a woman should behave. Instead, they sought after adventure and freedom and found it, creating a piece of the American mythos of the wild, wild west. In the fourth episode of A History of Women's Achievement in America, American women explode onto the national and world stage, redefining the professions they enter, continuing the tradition of creating women's institutions, and shining as internationally famous artists. Thanks for watching. I'm Donna Mills.